Hello everyone. So welcome to this second session of our webinar on voluntary sustainability claims on seafood products. Uh, as we learned yesterday, there are a lot and a plethora of labels, either private or public, and the most important thing is that they are credible. To do so, we have seen yesterday that some are approved by higher institutions like GSSI, but some few others are no more than a sticker on a product. Uh, so, we discussed the theoretical aspect of sustainability labels yesterday and today's session will focus on the experiences on actors in the field throughout the value chain, like the fishing sector, the aquaculture sector, the processing sector and the retail sector. We will then have two presentations that will show us the environmental and then the economic benefits and impacts of the labeling. Uh, so, if you have any question to the panelists, please use the question and answer chat button uh, on the lower part of your screen and uh, please specify the name of the panelists you want to reach. Or, so, he or she will answer you at the end of the panel, but you can write the question at any moment. Uh, regarding the busy schedule, I ask the speakers to respect the time dedicated to them and not to exceed. As a moderator, I will specifically take care of this. So uh, this will also allow participants to ask questions to the panelists at the end of each panel. Finally, I would like to thank again on behalf of the MAC, the European Commission for letting us organize this workshop and to thank all of you for being present today. This, show, this shows uh, to what extent sustainability is a key issue to the Europe of tomorrow. Uh, I also thank warmly our General Secretary, Pedro Reis Santos, for the organization of this workshop and his great work. So let's go directly to our first speaker, uh, Ms. Sophie Smedgaard uh, Mathieson, the biologist at the Danish Fisherman, uh, will present us the experience of the fishing sector with regard to labeling. So yeah. you have the floor. Thank you. I'll just see if I can share my screen. So I think everyone should be able to see it now and hopefully hear me. Uh, well, uh, first of all, thank you for the opportunity to speak today and thank you for the invitation. So I was asked to present and discuss uh, our experiences with eco-labels and certifying schemes from the perspective of the fishing sector. And I was asked to address both benefits, limitations, costs and other things that I could think of relevant for our experiences. So just to go back a step, I would like to obviously introduce the organization where I work because I think that's relevant for at least the experiences that we have in the scheme that we are certifying our fisheries under. So I represent a fishery organization called the Danish Fisherman Producer Organization, short for DFPO. Uh, I represent around 675 Danish vessels, and these are vessels ranging from maybe five meters and up to 50 meters. And they're engaged in all kinds of fisheries. We both have mussels and cockles and oysters. We have shrimp and brown shrimp, Norway lobster. There's mixed immersive fisheries for cod and sail and plaice and haddock, sole, hake. Uh, then we have the pelagic fisheries for mainly herring. And then we have the fisheries for sand, uh, for fish meal and fish oil. So that will mainly be sand eels, spread and Norway pouts. And then most of our fisheries, they are certified under the Marine Stewardship Council. So they are MSC certified. Um, and before going into detail to that, you could maybe ask a fishing organization why it's even important to have uh, eco-labeling. Uh, first of all, we believe that we have sustainable, well-managed fisheries in Denmark and eco-labeling is obviously a way to show the consumer and the general public uh, this so it's kind of an add-on to our sustainability claims so it's not just the fishery saying we're sustainable but we also have a, another party saying that then obviously it was also talked about yesterday it ensure our members access to the markets and in some uh, instances it also ensure a higher price for our members fish um, and then as a fourth point it's also uh, uh, important for us to have our fishermen aware of uh, is a sustainable development of the fisheries and this is also a way to kind of commit them to that um, development. And then obviously you could ask why choose MSC and obviously, obviously it's because it's uh, one of the most recognized eco-labels by both industry and retailers. 
Um, it has a high credibility in general, and then there's the MSC's overall three principles, which are very similar to the WWFC food guide, uh, where you have the three principles. You have the P1 on status of the stock, you have the P2 on ecosystem effects, and you have the P3 on the management. And these three points we think as a fishery is really important to assess whether or not you have uh, credible sustainability claims. And then a fourth thing that I was also touched on yesterday is obviously the accessibility of the program. And because we have so many different fisheries, we are always uh, we are obviously interested in having a labeling scheme where most of our fisheries can fit within. Um, and just as a, a broad overview, um, most Danish fisheries are MSC certified. So that means around 80 to 90% of all Danish landings, they're certified under uh, MSC. Um, it depends a little bit about the quotes are set and it also depends on whether or not you have fisheries being suspended from MSC certification. Um, some of these certification we do on our own and some of them we do jointly with foreign uh, partners. So that would mainly be fishery organization in the Netherlands and in Germany and in Sweden. And then some for the more pelagic fisheries we would do with our pelagic counterpart here in Denmark, uh, which is called uh, the Danish Pelagic Producer Organization. And then they have some interest in Northeast Atlantic, which are also MSC certified together with foreign partners. And um, so generally a lot of Danish fisheries are MSC certified. And then if we go uh, to the benefits of having these eco-labeling on our fisheries, uh, these uh, are very much linked to the reasoning why we want Ecolabel in the first place. Obviously, it ensures market access for our members. I think that's key and uh, very important for our members. And um, further to that, it shows our commitment to sustainable fisheries and then hence provide credibility to our sustainability claim, claims as a, as a Danish fishery. Um, and then generally, MSC, I think, is, uh, is open for all stakeholders to engage in the process of uh, further standard development. So you kind of feel like uh, your voice is heard uh, and the issues that you raise are taken serious. Um, that being said, the last point is also one of the limitations that we experienced um, in certifying our fisheries, because even though it is an open process, it requires quite a lot of work. So if you are a smaller fishery client or a smaller fishery, um, I'm not sure you would have uh, the manpower to actually go through the system and follow the process in detail. Um, another limitation would be that um, it's not always recognized in EU management as sufficient to claim fishery sustainability. Um, so that makes it difficult sometimes as a fishery organization that also needs to be involved in, in management both nationally but also on an EU level. Um, then you have a smaller issue with short-lived species. They don't completely fit within the standards so that gives up some challenges um, and you, that would mean that you have fisheries going in and out of the certification so you kind of have these yo-yo fisheries. So you, don't, um, you can be certified today but tomorrow you might lose certifications. Um, and then the main limitation, I think, is that the reason why you also want eco-labeling is because you want credibility um, in saying that you have sustainable fisheries. But even though you have uh, an eco-label on your product uh, or your fisheries, you don't really uh, avoid discussions on uh, what sustainable fishery is. So I think that's one of the, the biggest limitations. You still need to have that discussion anyway. Um, then if we go down to costs, uh, this is just for some of the work that we have done. So costs can vary quite a lot. You have all the costs associated with uh, assessing your fishery and holding up toward the MSC standard. That can cost you around 15,000 to 165,000 euros. It depends a lot about how you certify your fisheries. So if you pool more species within one certificate, you can save some money. Um, but this is just kind of like a, a range for the different certificates that we have. Uh, normally you can also, uh, or you would always have additional cost in relation to this in an assessment. You can have cost in relation to having stakeholder engagement, peer reviewers, uh, and then if you have an objection to your fishery being deemed um, or having certification, that can also cost you quite a lot of, uh, of money as a fishery client. And then in some cases, you also need to pay to get access to data that you want or you need for the certification. 
and you can also be forced to or not forced but you can uh, uh, need to pay managers and researchers to actually take part in site visits for proper insight to the fishery in relation to an assessment and so this is just something you do for each fishery every five years then every year you would have a surveillance audit of your fisheries and that can cost you anywhere between 2000 to 35000 euros it also depends a lot about the fishery in question um, and it depends a lot about how many conditions you have so when you get certified uh, a lot of fisheries have conditions on their certificate that they need to close within the five years that the certificate certification is let's certif certifying period is and um, so that can cost you quite a lot if you have several conditions because that obviously takes more time for the assessor uh, and hence more money it also depends a lot on whether or not you have on-site or off-site um, surveillance audits because if you need to fly in assessors from all over the world that obviously also going to cost you more so these are kind of the set uh, cost in relation to um, the certifying our fisheries then you can have additional costs you can have expedited audits so whenever you have a new isis advice and there's new information you need to consider for the stock in question you can launch an expedited audit and obviously that's going to cost you then you can have additional control costs in relation to maintaining a certificate or you can be forced to set up specific research projects in relation to conditions that you have for your certificate um, and i think the last one is actually uh, one of those costs where it can it can cost you quite a lot because obviously not all projects are relevant for managers and scientists they're only relevant for MSc purposes so it can be quite difficult to ensure funding and it can also be quite difficult to ensure engagement from both managers and research because they might want to spend their time differently than on the project you need to set up to close an MSc condition um, then other points uh, that are highlighted in this PowerPoint is uh, just generally our main concerns, observations going through uh, these many, many uh, assessments and certifications. So obviously we know the fisheries around the globe are very different and have different challenges, but a global eco-labeling machine she needs to uh, address all concerns, at least want to in some cases. Uh, and that sometimes requires fisheries to do additional and to some extent unnecessary work with added costs. Um, but I guess it will always be like that if you have a, a global scheme. Um, then at least for our part, EU rules and regulation we believe is largely set to ensure sustainable fisheries, but MSC does, uh, the MSC standard do not always recognize this as sufficient and appropriate management. Uh, so there can be some clashes there. Um, then it was also touched on yesterday that you have fisheries in FIPS uh, and they can be recognized as sustainable sourcing in the same way as uh, MSC certified fisheries and obviously as a fishery client that can be both good but it can also be, be bad. Um, then another point that we also learned is that in relation to fishery client seeking certifications in some cases you can see an objection to a fishery being certified, that's mainly for other stakeholders or from other stakeholders, or so mainly NGOs. And in some cases, you can see an agreement between a fishery client and an NGO closing an area for fish for fishery. And that's my concern is that is uh, from my point of view, it's really sidetracking a proper consultation period because other fishery client, other NGOs don't really have a chance to take part in that discussion and it's not really best practice for proper management in my view and further to this i think it can really interfere with markets in a kind of a worrying way uh, especially if other msc fisheries need to um, uh, respect other msc certified fisheries closed areas uh, whether or not they agree on the area needing closure or not um, and then I think the last point is really maybe our own fault as a fishery sector because uh, a lot of fisheries sustainability claims is tied closely to certification. Having a fishery suspended from the MSC or any other eco labeling scheme gives the general public the perception that the fishery is no longer well managed and overfishing is taking place. And this doesn't really help fishery clients or fishery sector in general to govern a responsible rhetoric um, on fisheries in general. 
And maybe just as an overall reflection on this is that it's always, and we know this, it's always a question of where to set the bar. Uh, and some would argue that MSC continues to raise the bar before getting enough fisheries in the program. So they're basically recertifying the same top fisheries. And for us, that's okay because we're still in the, in the top fisheries. But as the fishery client, we're obviously concerned about uh, the future direction of the MSC because some of our main fisheries, they're certified with a lot of conditions right now and they weren't previously. So that's kind of the effect of uh, the last uh, version or uh, the last uh, change of the standard. And then obviously, because they're reviewing and revising the standard by now, we would still be obviously concerned whether or not the bar is being raised yet again and our fishery are just hanging in there and still being certified. And then that kind of gives us an overall concern not just with MSC, but with any eco-labeling scheme that would be out there, is that if a broad scale of EU well-managed fisheries do not fit within the standard, um, then we can basically be forced to make the decision to leave the program because it's simply too much work required to maintain it. But we can also simply be forced out as a fishery, which I think is um, concerning because we do believe we have some of the most uh, well-managed fisheries in the world. Um, and maybe just as a closing comment, like from a fishery perspective, it's always a risk to let a private eco labeling regime set the standard on what a sustainable fishery is instead of letting EU managers and fisheries set the standard. And um, I think if you look at something, if you can kind of compare it with something, it would be like uh, EU's uh, organic logo, logo for farming. And a farmer would always know whether or not he's organic or has a logo or not. And the fishers don't really have that. So they're not, they can be sustainable one day, but then the next day they can be unsustainable. So that's a general reflexing, reflection, I think. I hope I, I answered your questions, Benoit. Thank you very much for this uh, really interesting uh, presentation. Uh, so I see one question. Uh, we will answer at the end, uh, or maybe Sofia, if you want to answer uh, directly in the chat. Uh, but we will move to Javier from uh, FIAP. Uh, we talk about the situation of uh, labeling in uh, Wallonia, in the south part of Belgium. Uh, he has to leave uh, at 11. So if you have any question to him, uh, feel free to ask the question during the presentation. He will answer at the end of the presentation and not at the end of the panel. Uh, but if you still have any question at the end of the panel or at the end of the, the session, I can answer for him. As basically, I, I've made the, <laughs> the presentation and the, the study case uh, in Belgium. So, uh, Javier, you have the floor. Thank you very much. Share my screen. Okay, I believe I'm there. Okay. So yes, this presentation is from the uh, Collège de Producteurs Aquaculture, uh, and it's uh, about the Aquaculture Stewardship Council label comparison with European and Belgium legislation. So if you allow me to expand the title, it would be basically if some fish are certified as sustainable or, well, responsibly produced, does that mean that those unlabeled that way are not sustainable? Um, so just uh, to put it in, in perspective, although you are very all aware, we have a plethora of quality labels, origin, sustainability, respect for different animals, can be dolphins, turtles, you name it, organic and others. Voluntary schemes that are out there. From all these, uh, we uh, want to point out uh, the AAC, Aquaculture Seawards Council is the most comprehensive one. It's got many species, 12 species in it right now, and more coming in all the time. Then we've got GAP certified, multi-species standards. We've got uh, Friends of the Seas, more strict on marine aquaculture, particularities like anti-fouling and, and, and so on. Um, in Belgium, in Belgium, if you go to a supermarket, the, the the scheme that you will or the label that you will see more often is ASC, and it's uh, for trout, for rainbow trout, that 
uh, we produce here in, in Belgium. Uh, trout has five, this scheme has five, five pillars on biodiversity, on the feed that are provided to the, uh, to, to the animals, to the trouts. It's about pollution, another pillar on fish health, and a fifth pillar on social issues. And in this presentation, I will go over them briefly, but on each of them. So, uh, on biodiversity, uh, to be certified as AAC, you must be outside Natura 2000 areas and, well, in, uh, in, in reality, all uh, in, in Wallonia, all our farms are, uh, have already been removed from Natura 2000 areas, so they are outside already. About minimizing fish escapes, so the Wallonian government decree from 2005 uh, ask operators to ensure that a screening system is placed upstream and downstream of the establishment of the fish farm to avoid escapement of fish into the natural to the, into the river and also to prevent the entering of wild fish into the tanks of the farm. Um, another point of the uh, AAC is uh, that it, that trout rainbow trout should not be uh, put in waters where they haven't been in the past and uh, what reality is that in, in Wallonia rainbow trout have been present, have been farmed for over 70, 70 years already, like actually like in most European countries. And another important point is about the amount of water that a farm can take out of the river and give it back to the river a few meters down. Uh, course of the river and um, the decree of uh, Wallonia on 2005 asks you is more demanding than that because you must leave without taking two-thirds of the flow that is reserved to for ecological purposes in the course in the water course. Second pillar uh, feed um, in AAC, you are supposed to minimize the use of uh, fish meal and you have to assure the traceability of the origin, both of the fish meal and soybean uh, meal. In, in, in Wallonia, the feed that is used are all already AAC certified, all the different companies that provide feed to our droughts. Uh, the next pillar, pollution. Pollution measurements have to be uh, taken at regular intervals of the several parameters, the limits and, and the timings are established by AAC. But at the same time, in the legal decree of Wallonia, there are very strict limits that are uh, already obliged to comply, the farmers are already obliged to comply with. And from a fish health point of view, uh, for AAC to be AAC certified, you have to have a risk management plan designed and followed by a veterinarian. But already, the uh, our farms in Valonia have to have their health the health status status of their fish checked twice per year, and you have there is an operator, operating veterinary uh, in Valonia that goes uh, two or three times per year obligatory to the farms depending on the risk. So it happens in any case. And uh, uh, preventive use of antibiotics is, is forbidden in ASC. Uh, basically the same for, uh, for, legal, for, for legal conditions in, in, in Belgium in which any antibiotic treatment uh, is, uh, is used in the minimal quantity possible and always under the prescription of a veterinarian and no products approved, non-authorized product approved can be, can be used and it's under the responsibility of uh, a professional veterinarian. So uh, the last pillar, social issues uh, in, for, to be certified as AAC and, and this links a little bit with what was presented by Sophie some, some minutes ago. Uh, there are some issues that uh, apply for the rest of the world when they come to a country like Belgium they seem to be out of out of uh, place but in any case you have to comply with uh, not having child labor in Belgium farms not have forced labor in, in Belgium farms you have to have a safe working environment 
you have a, to have a decent salary and uh, the, the working schedules have to be regulated. I don't have to explain that this is uh, compulsory already in, in Belgium law, even before AAC existed. And the difference is that with AAC, you do have to provide payments, uh, like basically like in MSC, the costs different, but you have to you have to have your you pay a, a fixed annual amount and uh, a, a, a variable quantity depending on on the volume that carries the logo in the supermarket. Um, at the same time, it's not only you who has to be uh, AAC certified. You have to. Uh, the value chain has to be uh, certified if you want to be able to 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 use the the, the logo. So all the the trout suppliers, in, in case of processors, they also have to to be audited. So at the end of the day, and understanding the concept behind a, a scheme like ASC, reality is that in Valonia, uh, carrying a trout rainbow trout carrying an ASC logo provides no added value. It does have extra costs, but it, it, it and, and, and those extra costs are not always recovered. So what we see, and this is the main conclusion of this presentation, is that in Europe, in Belgium, in, in Europe in general, for freshwater aquaculture, but also for all the types of aquaculture, uh, these responsibility, responsible or sustainability labels only serve to upgrade non-European productions imported into the EU, upgrade them to, to a certain level to on those specific issues, not on all, but all specific issues, to European production conditions. And uh, uh, well, thank you very much for your, for your attention. I hope you found this uh, interesting and you have contact details here, <clears throat> Benoit, or for myself, you would need them. Thank you very much. Thank you, Javier. Uh, uh, it was really interesting, of course. <laughs> uh, I don't see any question directly to you uh, for your presentation, only for Sophie. Uh, we will answer at the end of the panel for her. Uh, so if there are no specific question, uh, we will go. We'll be here in any case for that time, yes. Yeah. Okay. Uh, okay, we will go to our next uh, panelist. So, where is my program? There. Uh, so, now we will move to the processing, processing sector and to Mike Mitchell, uh, Director of Fair Seas Limited, uh, representing the United Kingdom Seafood Industry Alliance. So, so you have the floor. Uh, thank you, Ben. I just need to figure out how to share my screen. Um, let me see. Is this working? No. No. <laughs> so that's the first fail of the day. Um, let me see how to get back to that. Share screen, desktop, and should be there. No? You're not seeing it, are you? Uh, no. Uh, but, well, have you tried opening already the PowerPoint and then... Yeah, I have the PowerPoint open here. Okay, then maybe I'll just uh, share it on my side and you yeah. tell me. Okay, that's another way around it. Just, uh, just a moment, let me just see if... Yeah. And now it's appeared. Uh, we're doing it, we're doing it. Yeah. So you've got me now? Yes. Yeah. Super, so sorry for that technical incompetence. Uh, let me start. Uh, my name is, is uh, Mike Mitchell. I'm actually an independent uh, consultant working uh, in the seafood industry for uh, over 40 years now. So I have seen a lot of change uh, and I've seen a lot of development and particularly in this area uh, around uh, eco labels and sustainability claims. Um, I work uh, with a wide range of UK and European businesses, including retailers, um, some of the certification standard holders themselves. Uh, and importantly, today I work I, I work with a UK uh, business called Young's Seafood, 
a value-added processor and seafood, and seafood brand. Um, Young's are members of uh, an organisation called the UK Seafood Industry Alliance. Um, so I'm speaking on behalf of Young's and representing the Seafood Industry Alliance here today. So just a few words, just for context, uh, the Seafood Industry Alliance is a collaboration between two fe uh, trade federations, the Food and Drink Federation and the Provisions Trade Federation, um, aiming to give a clear voice on, on all seafood issues um, for uh, government and, uh, and other stakeholders for our domestic UK, EU and wider international markets. Um, and the Seafood Industry Alliance, that seafood group is a member of the European Federation of Federations uh, for Seafood uh, Processors and Traders, which is called APC, uh, CEP. So that's a little bit about the background of who I represent and the sector I'm working in. Uh, these are the Industry Alliance members. Um, so you can see the UK uh, and international uh, and European seafood companies are represented uh, in the Alliance. Um, so just a bit of perspective from somebody with a very market facing uh, role on uh, eco labels uh, and their importance and their roles. Um, clearly we can, we can use eco labels for two purposes. Uh, we can use them to communicate directly to the consumer uh, about the sustainability status of the product that, that we're selling them, uh, selling to them. Uh, but we can also use uh, eco labels as part of our supply chain due diligence uh, and risk mitigation processes. Um, to, uh, to be any use or any value um, uh, for those, either of those purposes, uh, we believe that eco labels need to be credible. And you'll probably hear me use the word credible quite a lot today because I think uh, somebody, maybe Sophie mentioned earlier or Benoit, maybe yourself in your opening comments that uh, sometimes eco labels are just stickers on a pack. Now that is, that is absolutely of no use. So we use the, uh, we, we um, think about the GSSI uh, benchmarking process uh, as the definition of uh, whether or not an eco label is credible or not. Uh, and clearly at the moment that includes uh, all of the major schemes that, that have been discussed today already. Uh, but of course not all seafood products are eligible to carry an eco-label. Eco uh, not all seafood sources want to enter eco-label schemes and indeed not all retailers and brands wish to include an eco-label on their pack even if they're sourced from an eco-label um, certified fishery. Um, so outside of eco-label eco use, there is a real need for a consistently applied approach, approach to making these self-declared uh, self claims of environmental responsibility. Um, it's essential both to protect the businesses that are making the claim uh, and uh, for reducing confusion uh, for consumers. And of course, an, an under, underlying principle of this is that we should not mislead the consumer in any way whatsoever. You also might hear me use um, the words pre-competitive uh, pre collaboration today as well, because uh, very much like the issue of food safety, um, uh, food sustainability is, is a, a matter of common interest. It's a matter of societal interest. Uh, it's very rarely used as a means of um, uh, engendering competitive advantage um, to ensure that we have a common understanding uh, and a common basis for um, establishing the criteria of consumer communications on seafood sustainability. It's clear that we need some shared rules and some shared vision of, of what this, this means. So um, I'm going to talk a little bit now about uh, uh, an in initiative called the Sustainable Seafood Coalition. Um, these are the members of the Sustainable Seafood Coalition. As you can see here, we have a lot of um, large retailers um, and uh, some um, uh, value-added processors, some importers. Uh, there, are, there are in fact 41 members of this organisation. Um, 36 of which are active seafood businesses or actively selling seafood and trading seafood. Um, there are um, some federations as well, including the UK Seafood Industry Alliance. You'll see our logo there in the bottom left hand corner. 
Um, around about 19 of these businesses have a primary focus in the food service sector. So that's out of home eating. Uh, and 22 are focused in the retail uh, sector. So either retailers or suppliers to retail. So it's a very broad um, collaborative platform to reach some common guidelines and rules about how we declare um, statements about sustainability to the consumer. So in order to create that common understanding, uh, we've actually created some codes of practice. Now these are voluntary, of course, uh, because it's a membership organization. So um, if you sign up to the, uh, become a member of the Seafood, uh, Sustainable Seafood Coalition, uh, you sign up to abide by these voluntary codes of practice. Um, they were created in the absence of any governing legislation um, on um, specifically about uh, claims of environmental, environmental responsibility. So if we go back in time a few years ago, five, six years ago, before these codes existed, there was um, a plethora of types of, um, of claims of sustainability being made to the, to the public. Um, some of them were absolutely valid and some of them were quite spurious. So we, uh, we did need to create a, a guideline a code of practice on why and how these, co uh, these claims could be made. So they were created collaboratively and pre-competitively by the industry uh, with some help from um, a legal orientated NGO called Client Earth. Um, the codes govern um, or give guidance on making sourcing decisions and any environmental claims of responsibility uh, based thereon. Uh, there are two risk-based decision tree processes embedded within the codes, one for wild capture fisheries and one for aquaculture. And of course, a lot of um, guidance notes sitting behind those decision trees. Um, the end game here was we, we decided that, that we would permit two types of claim. Um, one a uh, claim of responsibility and one a claim of sustainability. Um, so just to give you a little bit more detail behind those, uh, those claims that are in our toolbox. Uh, broadly speaking, we could describe a claim of sustainability as, as one that refers to an empirical evaluation of the resource status. So a science-based assessment of the resource sustainability. Whereas a claim of responsibility actually is a description of corporate behavior. So you can behave responsibly um, and source responsibly without um, necessarily having to source from an eco-label certified fishery. Um, so um, those, uh, the, if you like, the metrics that sit behind these claims are um, the use of a, a, an eco-label. So the eco-label in this case becomes a tool um, in helping us make a decision of whether or not we can uh, validate um, or support a claim of sustainability or responsibility. So GSSI benchmark third party certification standard uh, or an independent expert opinion um, that in effect would be a, a sort of a parallel assessment of, of the resource. So if it is a resource that is, uh, is not certified, um, you know, would, would it be possible for that resource to be certified should it wish to be so? So in other words, uh, it doesn't have to be um, uh, in a eco label scheme. Uh, but it could be eligible for one or would we would deem it would pass if it did enter. Uh, and then, of course, the other element is uh, engagement in a credible, transparent and time bound improvement initiative. These are these initiatives are typically called FIPS, Fishery Improvement Projects. Um, and indeed, eco labels play a, a third role here, um, as well as business to business and business to consumer assurance. Uh, an eco-label scheme can act as both an architecture uh, and an incentive to shape and develop uh, and incentivize a fishery improvement project. So orientating improvements towards a status where they would become certifiable. So we've de developed those claims into a hierarchy. Um, it, to, to, to qualify for a term of sustainability. So if you wish to say to the consumer, uh, this is a sustainable product or sustainably fished or any reference to sustainability, um, we say that product has to be sourced from a third party certified source that has been certified against a sustainability standard. So the standard itself has to be 
a sustainability standard, not a responsible production standard. Um, in real terms, I think there is only one um, eco label at the moment which markets itself as a sustainability standard. Uh, that would be the Marine Stewardship Council, and that is the one that is most widely used to support a claim of sustainability. If you didn't want to make a claim of sustainability and you preferred as a brand or as a retailer to make a claim of responsibility, you could source from any uh, third party um, eco label, um, a certified fishery. Um, and uh, in this case, you maybe not use the uh, logo. Um, whereas for a claim of sustainability, you would need to have the full chain of custody in place and the product would need to carry the eco label. So it's a fully third party endorsed claim. Um, so responsibility could be um, a product which is sourced from a responsible production standard. So here, for instance, in aquaculture, the ASC, Aquaculture Stewardship Council scheme, is a responsible aquaculture scheme. So that would support a claim of responsibility, but not sustainability. Um, you could also use your credible independent expert advice. And, and I would just add, even though I've talked quite a lot about that one, I, I would add a, a little pr um, pr a proviso on that. This is a very rarely used um, method. Uh, typically, uh, retailers would uh, and seafood brands would source eco label certified material and they would either use the logo on the pack and claim sustainability and res or responsibility or not use the logo and claim responsibility and then the third tool where uh, to qualify for responsible because it's a, a, a description of behavior is that the source uh, is engaged in a credible transparent and time-bound um, fishery or aquaculture improvement project and because that, uh, that is a, 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 an incentivization towards sustainability and responsible sourcing, uh, that would uh, qualify as responsible behavior by that retailer or brand. So that's, that's the end of, of my, my brief talk about the role of eco labels and, and those, those three primary uses, uh, business to consumer co communication, business to business assurance and the underpinning architecture and incentive for improvement initiatives. But I guess we could say there are some, some question, uh, questions about uh, what next uh, and gaps in the market that are not comprehensively covered by these existing standards. So I think the market is increasingly looking for common platforms uh, and common means of assuring um, that supply chains are operating to best practice, for instance, uh, in the area of human rights. Now that is an, an issue that was, that was discussed a little bit by Xavier uh, uh, with respect to aquaculture, but in wild capture fisheries, uh, human rights uh, is a very difficult issue to get any kind of independent third party assurance in the at sea fishing industry supply chains. Uh, and there are other, other environmental sustainability issues, such as uh, greenhouse gas emissions and uh, you know, car carbon uh, emissions uh, by the industry that are also out with outliers uh, from most of the third party schemes at the moment. So I think there are potential new areas that eco labels, uh, sustainability labels could uh, move into uh, to help add that assurance. Well, thank you very much. Uh, it was a really interesting analysis of the situation. Um, I'll just stop sharing now. There. So Benoit, that I think uh, brings me in about on time. I don't know if you want to deal with any questions now or save those for later. Uh, actually, there is one, but we will save it for later uh, for the end of the panel. So thank you very much. It was really interesting uh, analysis of the situation. Thank you. Um, so let's move to the next uh, speaker of the panel. Uh, so we will have the point of view of the retailers. 
uh, and we welcome uh, Andina Alfonso, Head of Quality and Research and President of the Continente Producers Club. Uh, so you have the floor. Hello, good morning, everybody, and thank you for the invitation. I'm going to share. Yeah. Okay. One more minute to open. Yes. So, um, my uh, presentation uh, will focus on our sustainability policy as a retailer, but just just to share with you this in this first uh, slide, you can uh, see because it's in Portuguese, it's written in Portuguese, but you can see a, a new paper bag that we are using in our stores. This is 100% uh, recyclable. And uh, with uh, this bag, we are reducing the 40% of plastic that we used to have in our stores and spend, of course. And uh, which means uh, that we are saving uh, 70 tons uh, of plastic per year. So just, just an, uh, an example. Uh, okay, so it, it's clear for all that uh, European Union is, uh, is the leading uh, region uh, concerning uh, fishery and uh, sustainability policies. And uh, we are, where common fishery policies has been the tool to ensure that fishing and aquaculture are uh, sustainable. Uh, nevertheless, uh, there are other initiatives, namely international NGOs like uh, WWF, Greenpeace, and IUCN that are uh, looking in, the, in depth to these species, which fishing might have an impact concerning uh, biodiversity, threatened by extinction, and other criteria. Uh, it's important to, to highlight uh, that these uh, three lists, uh, in, from our point of view, are, uh, they complement each other uh, since they have different uh, approaches and, uh, and uh, types of uh, different analysis. Uh, in Portugal and uh, at Sonai, we are looking for this uh, Portuguese uh, seafood guide. We also look for this uh, green uh, piece red list and uh, the red list from uh, IUCN. Uh, so just talking about a little bit about our sustainability policy. Uh, along the year, uh, we follow the evolution of these uh, three lists, the WWF, Greenpeace and IUCN. However, it's important also to highlight this um, IUCN is the one, at least for us, that has this uh, kind of uh, graduation uh, of severity, as you can see. Um, that's why we use uh, this list for the final uh, decisions or final commercial decisions, because for us it's, it's clearer than, than the other sometimes. So wh whenever we want to launch, uh, to launch a new species, First, of course, we look uh, to the national and new legislation, and then we, we double check with these uh, three lists. These recommendations from the three lists are, are uh, of a paramount importance for our commercial uh, team. So, um, we have uh, um, and other initiatives that we have uh, along the year in our stores. We as a retailer uh, have in, in Portugal the, the widest range of different species, so the widest portfolio I can say of fresh and the frozen uh, fish. And the, 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 the main objective is to give the chance to consumer to choose and to taste different products. Uh, with that we, we believe uh, that we can uh, uh, prevent the encouragement uh, to consume the same species every every day, every week. So we 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 believe that we we don't narrow their their choice. Um, 
we also started uh, to use the traffic light system that helps consumer to to choose uh, regarding environment impact and at the same time this uh, system allows uh, or allow us the, the assessment of uh, our own degree of sustainability along the year um, uh, with the, our suppliers, we, we have in, the, in their uh, contract specific uh, provisions uh, which include some uh, criteria of sustainability too. So just to, to summarize, from suppliers uh, to consumers, uh, we don't uh, accept suppliers that have illegal fishing practices and we value uh, fish from sustainable uh, sources. And we, we the, these initiatives, we believe that we contribute for the reduction of, concert, of uh, consumption of uh, uh, threatened species. At stores, we are uh, working to share more information uh, with our clients, namely from traceability information. And actually, we have um, we, we participate in a consortium from a Horizon 2020 project where one of the objectives uh, is the development of a technological platform to support uh, traceability uh, information. Um, and this is uh, the, called the uh, project, it's Valor Mar. Uh, the link is, is there if you want to, to check. Uh, it's a big project with uh, many partners and we, we are, as a retailer, very interested to be uh, with this uh, scientific uh, um, RTD performers and uh, industry uh, from uh, uh, fish to uh, Portuguese and, uh, and, uh, and not only Portuguese. Um, this year uh, we are working in this, uh, it's a project. Uh, we will uh, get the chain of custody certification for uh, four important products uh, for us for dried codfish. I think everybody knows the, the codfish from Portugal, um, the hake, redfish and uh, salmon. Uh, codfish and hake are considered uh, important uh, products uh, for our gastronomy and uh, redfish and salmon are, um, I can say that, uh, like a fast moving consumer product. Uh, these uh, four uh, products, uh, are from certified uh, suppliers, uh, salmon from ASC and the other ones from MSC. MSC. Um, and these uh, four suppliers are, uh, I can say, they are highly motivated to share with us and with our clients more uh, information about their own uh, process, their own products. And these products are handled and uh, prepared in our store, so uh, by our own uh, team. So we are uh, very motivated also and excited to, to, to have this final uh, certification at the end of the, the year. Uh, and finally, um, I would like to share with you uh, another example um, that we have in our uh, stores. Um, recently, <clears throat> we established a, a, a partnership with a Portuguese company that was uh, created very recently, uh, recently too, and um, where we have a, a project to grow uh, three different species uh, in aquaculture or offshore. Um, this, um, this production, it's located at Algarve, uh, which give, uh, give us the opportunity to have a, a short distance supply chain of Seabram, and we are starting with Seabram. And, um, at the same time, uh, we can better uh, follow that production in, from the point of view of the quality uh, department. So um, we have been following the, the installation of this project and uh, we have uh, been also ensure that they respond to our protocol uh, of sustainability, which is based on uh, ASC and we have some questions including the animal welfare practices, antibiotics and animal health, preservation of wildlife species and etc. So we, we had the first fish at our stores uh, around three weeks ago and uh, has been a, a star uh, product for our clients and we are very happy with uh, that too. So this is my um, 
presentation and I'm available for questions. Thank you. Thank you very much. So we have a lot of questions. So, uh, and you have the time to answer to that. So that's perfect. Uh, so maybe we will move first uh, the, the question to Sophie. Uh, I hope you are ready because a lot of them are for you. <laughs> Uh, so the first one, dear Sophie, thanks for the nice presentation. Wouldn't it be easier if uh, European management moves a globally, uh, globally accepted sustainability standards rather than having its policy decided in a political process? Um, that's, big, that's a big question. So um, my own view would be that it would probably be easier, but I'm not sure that you would have more sustainable fishery uh, on a local uh, level, because I think a lot of uh, management around the world, you would have different views in how to best manage your own fisheries and the ecosystems that you have within your own waters. And I think you really need to have that uh, regional or local um, management regime. You need to have that being placed somewhere and that will all, all kind of drown away in a global um in a global scheme like that. So that, that would be my worry. I'm sure it would be easier, but I'm not sure you would have more sustainable fisheries around the globe doing it like that. All right, thank you. Second one, dear Sophie, would you have any experience or knowledge if losing MSC status negatively affect the price to a greater degree than securing the initial certification provided in the minority return to the fishermen? Uh, yeah, so I, because I'm a fishery organization, I don't sell fish. Um, so I, I can't really say on the specific on the price. I do know that uh, it depends a lot. That's at least what I heard from my fishermen. It depends a lot on if I have a, a fishery um, being suspended from MSC certification. That really depends on whether another fishery client have that fishery certified or not. Because if it's over something like a stock status and all fisheries are losing their certification, most uh, buyers would still want the fish in their markets anyway. You could see the case from mackerel, I think last year or the year before that. So all mackerel lost it from the Northeast Atlantic, lost its MSC certification. So I, I still see mackerel on the shelf. So I guess they still have a good, <laughs> um, a good way to um, sell their product. Um, another thing would probably be something like um, having a fishery certified. I could have our uh, uh, one example from our herring fisheries in the inner Danish waters. Uh, they were certified, but then you had a new benchmark under the ISIS uh, reviewing the stock. Uh, and that kind of uh, pushed the reference values up where you needed to be above. So that kind of lost the certification. And that was in a case where you just got all retailers accustomed to having MSC certification. So I know some of those fishermen struggled having a um, access to the markets that they had previously before certification. So that actually meant quite a lot for those fishermen in that case. Thank you. So hold on, uh, still two questions. <laughs> uh, so thank you for your for an interesting presentation. I assume that for your benefits outweigh the concerns cost, otherwise you would not be certified. Can you comment on that? Can you provide an example of MSC standard which, which is outcome based, not prescriptive on policy, will not deem European management as appropriate or sufficient? Um, yeah, so the first comment, and thanks for the question, Hans. I, I hope it was kind of obvious in my, um, in my presentation that we actually also have a reason why we are MSC certifying fisheries and why we think MSC is the best uh, eco-label out there. So that's obviously why we do it. Um, the main reason is obvious for our members to have access to the markets that they are selling their fish in. So that is kind of the key question, or the key number one, why we are MSC certifying our fisheries. Um, I think that's the main point I can draw on that or the main conclusion I can do to that. And obviously we do believe that MSC has a very, um, um, we, we do believe it's the best uh, standard out there. So obviously that's why we're choosing MSC and that we, we want some of their credibility and sustainability. We obviously uh, want to be involved with the best and MSC is the best on eco-labeling. 
Uh, and the other point about EU management, that could be something like, um, <laughs> so if you have something like an ISIS advice saying that you can fish a certain amount of species the next year, even though um, uh, the stock status might not be as good as you want it within the MSC standard, MSC is kind of not acknowledging that you could still harvest fish from that stock, even though in the long term it's still by EU. Uh, the tag is set for being a sustainable harvest of the fishery and also in relation to EU and Norway agreements um, for some of our conditions to be closed on certifications we need an EU Norway strategy so even if we worked years and years to have an EU management plan for tag species now we also need an EU Norway strategy and as a fishery organization it's not easy to get uh, no, both the Norwegian and the EU managers and politicians actually agree on having a common strategy for species just for the purpose of having their fishery MSC certified. So that's where the fishery are some, sometimes a bit um, struggling. And that's what I mean about MSC not always being set at the point where it acknowledge uh, EU management practices and how they deem sustainable management. I hope that answered it. Thank you. And the last one for you. Uh, we'll do any figures showing what is the difference in the ratio return to those who supply the Sustainable Seafood Coalition retailers to those who do not? Um, I am not seeing the question. I, I think that one's for me, Benoit. Oh, yeah, sorry. <laughs> sorry. Excuse me. So yeah, uh, Sophie, it's, it's all for you. Uh, thank you very much for your participation uh, and uh, for, for your presentation. Uh, so Mike, sorry. Uh, so thank you for your presentation. Will you, any figures showing what is difference in the percentage return to those who supply the Sustainable Seafood Coalition retailers to those who do not? Uh, <coughs> yeah, it's, it's always difficult to try to, to quantify um, uh, commercial return for for sustainable practice and and in fact the the reality of the situation in in the uk uh in particular is that all of the major retailers um, um are members of, of the sustainable seafood coalition all of them except one i won't name the one that isn't but if you have a good look at the uh, logos on my slide you could probably figure it out but the one that isn't a member has actually agreed to um comply with the with the voluntary codes of practice that everybody else has signed up to so the reality is if you want to supply a uk retailer and indeed most of the major food service businesses you have to be compliant with the sustainable seafood coalition code therefore there is no point of difference therefore there is no premium so there there is no improved commercial return uh, for uh, supplying code compliant product. It is a given and it is a, uh, a prerequisite of being at the table to sell fish to those large businesses. Thank you. Uh, second question, uh, I suppose this is still for you. The consumer chain hierarchy sounds big challenge for development. Is end goal to adhere to sustainability as main label rather than on responsibility? yeah that's a, i think that's a really good good question um and the fact is that um it, in, in practice uh, the the claim hierarchy has not proven difficult uh, we've we've been um working this way for the last five or so years um and uh, the rules are simple um you can make two types of claim they're either based on uh, responsibility or sustainability criteria um, so it, it's it's not difficult. I'm forgot, I've forgotten the second half of that question, Benoit. You just took it off the screen, so I can't, I can't see it. Um, there were two parts of the question. Right. <laughs> yeah. Sorry. Uh, I have to find out that. Uh, Sounds big change for development. Is end goal to adhere to sustainability uh, yeah. as main label rather than yeah. on responsibility? Yes, yeah, ab absolutely. Well, um, in consumer testing, the claim of sustainability is uh, has the strongest uh, um, uh, value. Um, but um, of course, not, not every product uh, is eligible to carry a sustainability claim. 
and indeed there aren't any aquaculture products that could carry that claim under under our um, rules because they are responsible aquaculture schemes not sustainable aquaculture schemes so i think because seafood brands and retailers like consistency of message um, most in fact all all uk retailers have aligned around a 100 percent responsibly sourced seafood portfolio so um, whilst uh, the claims of sustainability have the strongest consumer resonance the practical reality is um, to have all of your category um, with the same message you have to opt for the responsibly sourced message thank you uh, and last question, I think, for you. Uh, thank you for your interesting presentation. Do you believe third party auditing and certification will be an appropriate response for at sea human rights claims in the seafood markets? Uh, okay, this, this is a complex question. Um, it, it could, it could um, really warrant a very complex answer, but I'll, I'll, I'll try to keep it, keep it simple. Uh, for, for one thing, I don't believe that um, seafood brands uh, and retailers wish to make a claim of uh, about human rights. Um, you know, to, to be able to say that there, you know, no slave, there was no slavery involved in the production of this product uh, is, is a fairly shocking admission about the state of, of the world um, if, if you had to resort to that. So it's not, I don't think it's ever going to be a consumer facing claim. But for business assurance, it's really essential that we get some tools in, in the box. And um, vessel-based or fleet-based certification is one of the developing fields. There is um, a responsible fishing vessel scheme uh, in its very early stages of development at this moment. It's being rolled out uh, by a global organization called uh, Global Seafood Assurances. Um, and that is uh, a vessel-based cert third-party certification scheme. Uh, but of course, human rights, even on land, um, it's difficult to audit uh, absolute assurance on, on, uh, on human rights compliance. And it, indeed, um, a, a number of um, audited and certified um, terrestrial uh, factories in, in uh, sportswear and electrical goods and, and other food uh, products um, have been found to have human rights abuses even though they've been audited. So I think we do need other tools. I think third party certification is one of them, but we increasingly need to find other ways of listening to the worker voice in the fishing industry and being able to detect uh, the danger signs that people are being abused uh, because the at sea industry is particularly susceptible to human rights abuses. It's an industry that uh, is um, beyond the horizon. Uh, it's very difficult to inspect. It's very difficult to visit. And uh, the truth is, at the moment, we have very, very few tools available to us. So they have to develop, and vessel-based certification will be one of those tools uh, in the future. I think you're muted, Benoit. Thank you. <laughs> so thank you very much for, for your answers. Uh, I think the next one is for Andina. Uh, where can I find a list of existing ecolabel in the fisheries yeah. and aquaculture sector? I've, I've, I've answered already some questions <laughs> while <laughs> trying to save some time. <laughs> so um, let me see where is the question now or can you please repeat it? Yeah, where can I find a list of existing ecolabel in the fisheries and aquaculture sector? Which of them include social aspect of sustainability? And as regards fishery, yellow C188 respects can be a valid criteria to, me to measure social sustainability. Wow, it's a very big question <laughs> and long question to answer. <laughs> so uh, we, we have this uh, traffic light, uh, which is uh, based on... Uh, I. I the, the way or the practices of uh, fishing. So in, in Portugal, we have a lot of artisanal uh, vessels and fishing and we eat a lot of fish. Actually, we are the first uh, uh, in, in, uh, in the Europe to, to fish, to eat more fish. We have uh, 
50 or 60 kilos per uh, capita per year, so it's a lot of fish. And uh, uh, this traffic light has four uh, degrees. Uh, one is the, the low, uh, uh, which means it's the green one, uh, where we say that is uh, low impact concerning uh, biodiversity or other uh, marine ecosystems. And then we have the median and the high. Um, but it, it's important also um, to highlight that we are always uh, uh, beyond the, the legislation. So we are more strict than the, the legislation. Um, and also we have the, the blue, uh, the blue color. Uh, it, uh, that, is, uh, that means that it, it's produced on um, a certified uh, aquaculture. Uh, so we, we give this uh, information, uh, we are starting to give this information some big stores on the big cities because uh, also consumers are much more uh, willing to, to, to know and with this COVID um, crisis uh, we, we feel and we, we saw that consumers are requesting more and more information about origin and about all the, the information that they can get. Maybe sometimes they don't know how to, to interpret or to, to, to know and to analyze what that information means. But anyway, we, we want to share more and more with them. So um, what at the end of the year, we look to these, um, the, the quantities that are sold uh, per degree. And uh, this can uh, give us a kind of dashboard about uh, the consumption, the choices, and then we can uh, decide in the, in, uh, from the commercial point of view, uh, our strategy for the next year. So this is the, the, the initiative that we are starting to, to do some months ago. Thank you. Uh, so the next one, I don't know. Uh, hmm. Uh, to which panelist uh, want to answer to that the European labeling method could reduce cost boosting labeling and thereby sustainability that's a question uh, want to answer yeah nobody <laughs> no, okay. <laughs> well, right, maybe. Yeah. yeah. So, so uh, am I understanding this question correctly? Do you think that uh, if there were a standardized European sustainability standard it would reduce the costs to the industry and improve sustainability is that do you think do you think that's a, a correct interpretation mm -hmm. yeah so for, for me the only i think i think there's some challenges around this uh, in as much as the U european union is uh, has responsibility for um managing the fisheries uh and um if they were to, if we if we were to have a uh, a European Union method of certifying sustainability, then some European fisheries would clearly not qualify. So you would you would have a sustainability eco label, which um, endorses sustainability for some EU managed fisheries, but not for others. And I think that potentially places the EU in, in, a, in a compromised position with some conflict of interest between their role as manager and certifier. So I was, I was just trying to step in and, and offer something for, into the void of silence there for you, Benoit. But that, that is my top of the head thought about that question. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, it's an interesting uh, answer. Thank you. Um, so this one is done. Uh, Sophie, I think it was done, but <laughs> there's some remaining questions for you. Uh, if the politicians follow ISIS advice, that will be in line with MSC requirement or not? Um, I think 
It's maybe a twofold question because uh, if you could say it may be, be in line with the P3, but normally it depends on the status of the stock, so it would be a P1. So even if you set an attack in line with the um, with the ISIS advice, you might still get the fishery suspended because it's under the reference points where you want the stock to be. So you might have a quota on 13,000 tons of cod, but you can't sell it as MSC certified. Thank you. I will move to the last one for Andina. Uh, so congratulations to all speakers. Um, I have a question for Andina. I would like to know if your group will extend the certification to other species, namely wild fish from the Azores, uh, which as everyone should, uh, should know, I suppose, uh, is of excellent quality. Thank you. Um. Thank you for the, the question, but I don't know how to answer it at this moment. Uh, and uh, honestly, <laughs> we are focused on these uh, four species, uh, as I said, um, and next year we will see. But anyway, we have, um, we have this fantastic fish only from Azores, but all from our Atlantic coast in, uh, and Algarve also. So uh, we, we, we will see next year, honestly. Sorry. Uh, so thank you. The last question. Um, oh, uh, no, the last question <laughs> uh, about socioeconomic. I suppose this is for you, Andina, again. Uh, how is socioeconomic sustainability valued in certification? Most of the fishery products marketed in the European Union come from imports by producers from third countries. How these products are certified on equal terms with the producers of all the USA? Uh, this is a very difficult uh, question. Um, uh, as Portuguese, we, we eat a lot of fish, as I said. Uh, we eat a lot of fresh uh, fish. And the ones that are imported are mainly uh, frozen fish. And it's not, um, I, I would say that we, we are trying with this um, uh, project with Zebra trying to invert uh, some uh, importation uh, of this uh, species, which is uh, highly consumed. Uh, it's not frozen, of course, it's fresh, but we, in, concerning the frozen, uh, we, we have um, uh, a partnership with the specific labs uh, on third countries uh, that help us to certify uh, and to audit these uh, producers from, for example, uh, in Africa with the seafood uh, that we, we import from the kind of sh the shrimps. Um, and we, we also, we go uh, as a quality department, um, we have our checklist and we have a team that we go to the suppliers and to validate uh, uh, the documentation that they send uh, we, we go and uh, with this partnership with the local uh, labs, we try to, of course, to guarantee that we are uh, buying from uh, all, not only from sustainable source, but all this uh, social and uh, other topics that are uh, important for us from concerning human rights and uh, other things. So this is a, a, a big, uh, I would say, um, work with the uh, other partners that we, we have to have otherwise we couldn't guarantee that we are uh, selling uh, fish from a responsible source at least thank you very much uh sophie a question for you do we have a real life example where ACS advice was followed not certified as meeting the msc standards uh, I can't remember the last issue we had on cod. So cod in the North Sea is obviously um, um, suspended from uh, the MSC standard due to where the status of the stock is, but you're still allowed to fish and it's still a legal fishery and it's still a quota set in huge, well, uh, mainly in line with the, uh, with the ISIS advice. Uh, I'm not saying that there's anything wrong in where MSC sets its bar. I'm just saying that it might not 
be the same place as where for us it's a worry because you have uh, ISIS advising on attack that would be set in, li in line with long-term sustainable yields but even if you have that and it's set in line with that uh, you as a fishery client need to explain why you are still allowed to fish that stock when it's now losing MSC certification that's kind of the point that I want to draw so for a fishery client, it's kind of frustrating that you have a fishery that an EU management system is a legal fishery and it's set uh, in line with the with the ISIS advice, but the status of the stock doesn't allow it to be in the MSC scheme, which is completely fair. That's MSC deciding on where they set that standard. That is that isn't me, and that's why it's good you have a third party standard setting that scheme and not and not me because I can say it's a legal uh, and sustainable fishery but I don't have a third party saying that. Okay thank you very much and the last one I think it was the third part of a long question uh, so I suppose this is for Andina. Uh, so yellow C188 convention on working uh, in fisheries can be considered a standard for social ecological that's a question. I'm happy to take that, Benoit, oh, because it, yeah. it, it, it really relates to the human rights auditing, which I, I was talking about in my presentation. And yes, absolutely agree. Um, the Convention 188, uh, which uh, looks at work conditions in the fish industry, um, is, is being used already as the under, underpinning architecture of the, the very early schemes uh, to try to certify uh, social uh, justice or um, human rights in fisheries. It's the um, it's the basis of the responsible fishing vessel scheme, which is the one I talked about. I think it's also the basis of the private um, certification held by the Spanish tuna business OPEGAC, um, and I think it's also considered in the uh, Fair Trade US um, wild capture fisheries scheme. So it is already being used and it, and it certainly will, in, in the same way that the United uh, Nations uh, Code of Conduct on, Resp on Responsible Fisheries has become the basis of a lot of the Responsible Fisheries uh, certification. I think ILO 188 will become the determining um, uh, basis of any human rights assessments uh, that we try to develop for the catching sector. So, thank you very much. Uh, so, we yeah, are uh, right on time. So, thank you very much to all the panelists. Uh, it was really interesting. I think, given to the number of questions, uh, we can say that uh, it was interesting for all the participants too. So, thank you very much. And we will move uh, directly to the next panel uh, on the benefits and impacts uh, first on environment, uh, environment and then on the market. So uh, we'll give the floor to Dr. Eva Apionau, uh, <laughs> sorry, <laughs> uh, postdoctoral research uh, associate uh, at Helmholtz Center for Ocean Research and Geoma. Uh, you have the floor. Certainly, thank you very much. Just a second. Is everything visible? Yes. Yes. Uh, thank you very much for the invitation. And uh, I just wanted to mention that I was very inspired uh, by all the previous speakers and discussions. It was also a pity that I couldn't, uh, you know, uh, ask myself some questions to the panelists because I think that they raised some very interesting uh, topics. My presentation today will uh, basically be a review of the impacts and benefits associated with uh, eco-labeling on the marine environment. And here what I have basically tried to do is like uh, select some pictures that uh, to my view highlight, you know, the urgency and the salience of the discussions that we have been having, you know, how eco-labels and what is their role in, for instance, you know, uh, ensuring and promoting sustainable fish stocks in the context, of course, of uh, policy objectives and the policy environment uh, that might be present for the exploitation and use of the particular fish stocks, or how eco-labels can contribute 
to the to environmentally fishing practices, you know, you know, and uh, not introduce negative fishing practices, and all that in the context of a never changing marine environment, environmental variability, and climatic change. And I think in order to review the role of eco-labels, I think it is essential to uh, try and answer the questions. It was also framed yesterday, I think. What elements should fisheries eco-labels possess and as a result certified fisheries in order to maximize benefits and also minimize impacts in the marine environment? And to that end, I think it is necessary to review uh, current uh, eco-labeling schemes you know, try and determine strengths and limitations that they might have in order to suggest, you know, improvements, like if, if there is room of improvements and how these schemes can be improved. And of course, discuss also the role of policy and the market in promoting and implementing sustainable fishing eco labels. And to that end, I use an approach that has also been very well covered both by Sophie earlier and yesterday by the WWF. Uh, we need to establish, you know, some principles of sustainable fisheries and review how these principles are actually met. And here what I have actually tried to do is uh, see how certified fisheries globally relate with uh, the status of target fish stocks, the principle one. Also other principles such as the impacts fishing might have on the environment and the presence of uh, or absence of an effective management framework. And regarding the first uh, objective, the first uh, principle, the status of the target fish stocks, what uh, we basically try to do is get a uh, hold of information pertaining to stock assessments globally and see how the current certification schemes for certain fish for certified fisheries by the uh, Maritime Stewardship Council uh, relate with the, with the objectives of the stock assessments. And here what you can actually see is like I those are pre preliminary results and those are results for MSC certified fisheries up to December 2019. So this reality there might actually have been changes of course in the number of fisheries. But what we have actually done is assess the certified fisheries. So not simply uh, fisheries that are undergoing assessment have been suspended or withdrawn from the program. And this was a, a total number of 174 fisheries. And what we have actually tried to do is uh, assess how the mortality, uh, the fishing mortality of the current fishing mortality of the certified fisheries and the current biomass compares with the respective uh, objectives and goals relating to uh, fishing mortality that achieves the maximum sustainable yield and the biomass under maximum sustainable yield. And it was interesting to note that in both cases, uh, we see that uh, the majority of fisheries, of certified fisheries that is, do have a current fishing mortality and a current uh, biomass levels above the respective uh, goals. But there is a number of uh, fisheries that are below. So the, the thing that you see in red here and here respectively. And what is particularly interesting is when you assess both the indices, so both a fishing mortality below the maximum sustainable yield and a biomass level above the maximum the, the biomass under a maximum sustainable yield, you see that there is a large number of certified fisheries that are not meeting these uh, particular requirements. Another aspect that uh, relates with environmentally friendly fishing activities relates with the impacts that uh, fishing activities might have on habitats. And I think that this is something that is uh, actually stressed also in the EU, in the recent EU biodiversity strategy, you know, the ensuring, you know, that fishing activities are in line with the uh, good fishing practices that have like minimal impacts on habitats. And it was interesting to know that if you do plot uh, these uh, 174 certified fisheries, you see that the majority of the activities are using, of the fishing of certified fisheries are using bottom touching gear and there are small, there's the contribution of like uh, static nets for instance or like more sustainable fishing practices so to speak is uh, small and I think that this also has uh, implications in the context of emerging policies such as the EU biodiversity strategy but also the UK banning on review. 
And another aspect relates with the bycatch of endangered, threatened, and protected species. And I think this is something that a lot of the environmental NGOs have raised in the past. But what is actually particularly interesting is that it is not only a matter of, you know, a small scale fisheries, for instance, or, you know, fisheries that take place in the southern hemisphere, for instance. But it is also a case of uh, fisheries that have a very strong management context, such as, for instance, uh, uh, American fisheries, let's say. And here, what you can see is that the, uh, the Sorry, can you hear me? No problem. Um, yes? Could you just please uh, share your, your screen again? Of course, certainly. The bycatch levels here is back to the impacts that it might, that the certified Sorry, fisheries. We, we don't see your screen. What about now? Not yet. Okay. Yeah. Excellent. Thanks. Yeah. And what these bars actually say that there is, an, especially during an early period, uh, uh, during 2001 and 2005, uh, the impacts that uh, certified fisheries had on. Uh, uh, marine mammals population was like comparable to the white, that is the uh, non-certified fisheries for different for fisheries of different uh, categories with respect to the impacts on uh, marine mammals, as this has actually been established by the fishing authorities of the country. And I think that those are particularly interesting and important things to have in mind, especially in the context of the revision of the fishery standard of the MSC. And I do understand what has also been touched by previous uh, speakers, that you do need to have, you know, a consistent, uh, a consistent definition of what an endangered, threatened or protected species might mean. But at the same time, you do need to take into account the regional or local specificities of the particular population of uh, an ETP species. So, for instance, you know, a specific species might have a minimal concern in a global context, but in a regional context, it might actually be a species of a, that, is, that has a critically endangered status or is like highly vulnerable. And with respect to that, I think what is important as conclusions, but also as recommendations for the further improvement of uh, eco-labeling schemes, but also for the development of new eco-labeling schemes, it is important to uh, ensure that the certification uh, of uh, sustainable stocks takes place. So suspend or withdraw certifications if uh, stocks show, show signs of overfishing and uh, uh, exceed uh, uh, levels that do not lead to maximum sustainable yield. And for those stocks that are shown to have uh, signs of overfishing or largely picked, ensure that certification actually takes place after the recovery of the stock as opposed to certifying stocks that might uh, have like uh, of depleted stocks and then placing conditions. And with respect to the environmental impact, so to the impacts that the fishery might have, suspend, withdraw the certification if fishery is shown to have to use destructive gears or takes place within uh, marine protected areas. I was really impressed with what have you presented earlier, you know, that the, the no natura, you know, that the aquaculture farms cannot be installed within natura areas, for instance. And of course, I think what is a particularly important is to consider that the, the cumulative impacts, so that the, the unit of assessment might not be the only fishery that might exert, you know, a bad environmental impacts on the uh, uh, endangered, threatened and protected species, but also on the habitats. And of course, the impacts of climate change as those have been also 
set forward by the EU biodiversity strategy in this emerging policy context. And I think it is important to keep in mind that uh, different fisheries might be certified under the same eco-labeling scheme, but have different degrees of sustainability, so to speak. And I think that this might lead to, you know, different uh, perceptions from the consumers and as a result have uh, negative distortions, for instance, in the market, uh, as it uh, compromises the role of truly sustainable fisheries in the process. And I think that it is important to ensure that those limitations of uh, fisheries uh, certification schemes are clearly communicated to the consumer. Otherwise, they might eventually lead to the loss of trust. And uh, this might, of course, like have direct impacts on shops, retailers, and you know, the, the next steps of the, of the production of the, of the chain. And to that end, I think the role of policy, and I, this is something that was uh, also touched by the previous uh, speakers, it is important to remember that policy actually, and the provisions of policy, might actually be more strict than the criteria or the, of the eco-labeling schemes. Uh, for instance, you know what means, you know that under the common fishery policy, you are required to achieve maximum sustainable yield, for instance, or you know the advice that is provided by the ICs and how this is taken up by the uh, actual of the EU ministers and the implications that this might in turn have on the fishery. You know, like for instance, the changes in quota result, you know, in the certified fishery actually. I mean, the discussion of the lower quota was clearly communicated, but the opposite might also occur. So, in the case that you ask, you have higher quota for a certified, for a truly certified uh, sustainable fishery, this might lead to a loss of premium, you know, with the implication that the, uh, the increased supply in the market might have. And uh, if this eventually leads to overfishing, we can actually see the fishery withdrawing from the particular program. And the role the market can play to that, I think it is important that uh, we orient purchasers at above simple rules and only accept the uh, sustainable fisheries that uh, exclude overfishing and destructive gear. And of course, they need to diversify and promote markets for secondary species and species that are not so commercially important, so to speak. And I would like to end with what I think Benoit yesterday, you know, like wise, wisely described that if a resource sustainability is the DJ, it is important to remember that the marine environment is actually the venue where the DJ is to play the music. And with that, I would like to thank you for your attention and I am happy to answer any questions that you might have. And sorry for the technical difficulties. Thank you very much. It was again really interesting. Uh, really, really interesting analysis uh, with the outcomes. Um, so, the, yeah, there is some question uh, from Patrick Murphy. Hi Eva, thank you for your presentation and highlighting the need to constantly work to develop systems to protect all marine life. Is it also prudent we consider management and development of the new technologies within the industry as a better measure than an eco label for climate change is changing fisheries as we speak. So to keep sustainable fisheries, we must keep working hard at it. I agree fully. I think that this is a a very good point actually that uh, you know especially you know with the uh, shifting distributions or shifting abundance of species those are essential elements to consider and it is also important to remember that those levels you know of the MSY are actually set assuming a stable you know conditions you know and this is actually a very good point yeah I hope I answered. I think it was more a statement than an answer, yes. Yeah, yeah, it was not really a question, actually. You're right. Uh, so if there is no more question, uh, we can move uh, to the next panelist. And uh, oh, 
just a new big question. Uh, thank you for your presentation. I believe this presentation was not showing the impact of certification. It might be showing the status of the fisheries impact, if the data are correct, and if you disagree, exactly, uh, disregard, sorry. Uh, exactly the things Sophie raised on management context. In any case, those are two different things. The interesting thing will be to understand what happens as a result of certification. This is how certification drives change and has impacts on the water. Uh, for example, that fisheries have to reduce their footprints on target stock or on bycatch. So rather than a static, you need a dynamic picture of the target stock or ETP, bycatch, etc. over time. Have you done such an analysis? Uh, did you do analysis of other certification schemes as well? And uh, your conclusion that uh, European Union policy is more stringent was uh, actually said to be the other way around, as Sophie explained. So uh, it would be good if Sophie could react to that. Mm -hmm. Did I answer first? I don't know, yeah. Yeah, you can, you can answer first. Yes, so I, I de definitely this is like more the global context than it is more from the con from the you know the perspective of the consumer. I do understand you know that uh, specific fisheries might demonstrate you know progress with reference to specific like uh, uh, objectives, specific goals. But I think it is important to remember you know that uh, when we are talking about the sustainability of of resources or of the you know. Uh, sustainability of endangered, threatened, and protected species, limitations that might emerge by the, or you know, handicaps, let's say, or limitations that might emerge from the fact that those things are, you know, specified this way, is important to keep in mind. Uh, I have, I personally have not been engaged in the analysis of other certification schemes, but of the particular certifi for certification scheme, exactly because of what other people you know, discussed earlier, it is the more visible and the more, you know, the more visible and the one that is uh, more taken up by the industry itself. And uh, with reference, I think, yes, I do believe that the EU policy is more stringent in a lot of perspectives with respect to stock sustainability, ETPs, and so on, than the respective, you know, standards that are set by the co-labeling schemes in a lot of levels. So I think I answered the question, but I am happy to hear the reactions from other participants, definitely. Yeah, Sophie, uh, could you react to that? Um, I think it's maybe a bit of a broad question. So um, I think it depends on what aspects of the fishery you're looking at, because at some points I think you could have the MSC being more stringent on things, and then at other points I could see uh, EU policy being more stringent. So I'm not sure I see that black and white. Mm -hmm. yeah. But maybe I'm misunderstanding the question, and then I'm, I'm sorry. Uh, so we will see if Hans is, uh, is good with your answer. Or not. Uh, yeah. Anyway, uh, so anyway, we will come back to that at the end of the next uh, presentation. As uh, actually, this is two different panels, but only with one panelist each time, so that's not a, a big problem. Um, all right. So uh, let's move to the next one. Uh, for market benefits, cost and limitation, uh, we will welcome Dr. Jose Luis Fernandez Sanchez, Professor Business Administration uh, at the University of Cantabria. Sir, you have the floor. Me oís? Bien, lo único, eh, si podéis poner la presentación antes de comenzar. Uh, sí, sí, uh, un momento. Um...
Uh, uh, ¿Ya está? Uh -huh. Sí. Yeah. Bien. Eh, muchas gracias. Eh, buenos días a todos. En primer lugar, me gustaría agradecer a Mac eh, por invitarme a participar en este curso tan interesante sobre las ecoetiquetas y ecocertificaciones en el mundo de la, de la pesca y acuicultura. Y bueno, pues eh, el, la presentación que voy a hacer está relacionada pues, con los beneficios y costes, limitaciones que tienen estas ecoetiquetas en el, en el mundo de, de pesquero y de la acuicultura. Sobre todo pues, los beneficios o costes que tiene para las empresas que, que trabajan en la cadena de valor de los productos pesqueros y acuícolas. Bien, eh, punto de partida de la presentación. ¿eh? Eh, si podéis poner la siguiente diapositiva. Bien, eh, tenéis ahí lo que es la... la, la tenéis ahí lo que es eh, una definición de, de lo que sería el etiquetado, ecoetiquetado o ecocertificación de los productos pesqueros y acuícolas como aquellas eh, etiquetas ¿no? que acreditan, certifican que los productos pesqueros o acuícolas han sido obtenidos digamos eh, con el mínimo impacto eh, posible sobre los ecosistemas marinos. ¿no? Bien, aquí es una definición que refleja eh, lo que es la sostenibilidad medioambiental, pero no hay que olvidar que una parte importante para, para conseguir la, la, la sostenibilidad medioambiental es también eh, la sostenibilidad económica y sostenibilidad social, ¿no? que se habla muchas veces. De que detrás del mundo de la pesca y la acuicultura hay grupos de empresas y de personas y de productores y procesadores y que también pues bueno pues hay que buscar eh, la sostenibilidad eh, futura eh, tanto económica y social de estos grupos eh, de individuos o sociales bien eh, en la siguiente diapositiva podemos ver de manera resumida un poco los eh, principales beneficios a nivel económico que pueden aportar las ecoetiquetas ¿no? en el mundo eh, de, la, de los productos pesqueros y acuícolas. Bien, la, la, el primer beneficio que se puede encontrar en una empresa o un productor con su producto ecocertificado pues sería el que eh, los consumidores van a tener mucho más fácil eh, encontrar estos productos que, digamos, acreditan que están eh, certificados o que eh, van a proteger el medio ambiente. ¿no? Entonces, eh, esta certificación lo que hace es eh, económicamente reducir lo que se llama en economía las eh, asimetrías de información y reducir lo que se llaman los costes de transacción, con lo cual va a hacer que la búsqueda de estos productos sea para el consumidor pues mucho eh, más rápida y sobre todo pues más económica ¿no? y evita estos costes. Otro beneficio que puede aportar eh, el ecodeo certificado o la ecoetiqueta es eh, que puede servir como una herramienta de marketing para el productor. ¿eh? Sobre todo el, el, la ecoetiqueta le va a dar una visibilidad o una mayor visibilidad al producto dentro del mercado y con ello pues el productor va a conseguir una diferenciación de su producto, ¿eh? Eh, va a poder también segmentar el mercado, dirigir su producto a ciertos segmentos de mercado y con ello lo que se busca es obtener lo que se llama un, un premio ¿no? en el precio, un price premium. Eh, que es conseguir pues, un mayor precio al vender el producto y con ello un mayor beneficio eh, con la venta de ese producto. Otro beneficio que puede aportar eh, este, esta, este eco ecoetiquetado sería eh, que para las empresas o productores de estos productos pues, eh, conseguir una mejor imagen en el mercado eh, consiguiendo así pues, eh, una mayor reputación ante los clientes y otros stakeholders eh, que participen o que se interrelacionen con nuestra empresa. 
¿eh? Por ejemplo, tenemos el, el caso de, ¿no? de McDonald's y MSC, ¿no? ¿Eh? Pues como McDonald's puede conseguir una mayor reputación de su producto y de su marca ¿eh? y de su empresa a través ¿eh? de vender productos con esa certificación MSC, ¿no? Que la idea es que al final eh, una mayor reputación de la empresa pues se convierta en unas mayores ventas o ingresos para, para nuestra empresa. En algunos casos también las ecocertificaciones pueden servir como barreras de entrada a los mercados. ¿eh? Así eh, puede hacer que ciertas importaciones de pescado, de productos pesqueros, que no estén ecocertificados, pues eh, lo tengan más difícil pues, para entrar en ciertos mercados, por ejemplo, en ciertos países desarrollados, o aunque entren en esos mercados, por ejemplo, en los mercados ya a nivel de distribución, en minoristas o grandes distribuidores, pues que realmente pues, eh, se les cierren las puertas porque no están certificados medioambientalmente. Y por último, en otros casos, pues también nos puede permitir el entrar en nuevos mercados. ¿eh? Por ejemplo, en mercados como puede ser el mercado Oreca, ¿eh? de restauración, eh, eh, un mercado que puede ser eh, muy beneficioso o eh, incluso pues, en, en mercados de países desarrollados con altos niveles de, de renta, lo que nos puede permitir pues, incrementar nuestras ventas y nuestros ingresos. Bien, eh, en la siguiente diapositiva podemos ver eh, de manera sintética las principales desventajas ¿no? eh, que a nivel económico conlleva el ecocertificado. Eh. Eh, en primer lugar, eh, pues el coste más importante es el coste de la certificación, ¿no? los costes que podemos tener tanto de certificarnos, costes administrativos o de gestión de la, de la ecoetiqueta, bueno, pues eso nos, nos va a suponer un coste para la empresa, para el productor y es una, una limitación ¿no? al, al a, eh, el implementar una ecoetiqueta. Y también otro, digamos, otra desventaja que, corre, eh, que puede conllevar es el es enorme esfuerzo organizativo ¿no? que puede suponer para una empresa o para un grupo de, 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 de productores pues el tener que implementar este tipo de coetiquetas pues por todos los controles, inspecciones que hay que llevar a cabo en el tiempo, pues todo eso supone un estrés o un esfuerzo mayor a, a la organización. Bien, a, a partir de ahora eh, lo que voy a presentar es eh, unos ejemplos de, eh, a nivel empírico, en concretamente tres trabajos diferentes que dentro de, eh, de la Universidad de Cantabria, del grupo de investigación en el que yo participo, eh, durante estos últimos años hemos ido trabajando relacionados con temas de, de ecocertificación y otras certificaciones o etiquetados. ¿eh? Eh, eh, cómo influyen en, en los resultados o rendimientos de, de las empresas. Bien, el primer eh, caso que, que quiero presentar es un, un estudio que hicimos dentro de un proyecto europeo que fue el proyecto Subsex. Eh, a principios del año 2017, pues mandamos un cuestionario a diferentes empresas en Europa. Eh, que, que participaban dentro de la cadena de valor de, eh, del mundo de los productos pesqueros y acuícolas y les hicimos un cuestionario eh, sobre diferentes cuestiones relacionadas con la implementa, implementación de, de ecoetiquetas y otro tipo de, de certificaciones o acreditaciones a nivel de calidad, por ejemplo. Bien, no, la respuesta no fue muy amplia, con lo cual, bueno, pues el, el estudio no tiene a nivel estadístico eh, una importancia relevante, pero bueno, sí que sirve un poco para, debido a la falta de estudios de este tipo, pues bueno, pues hacernos una idea de, eh, de algunas cuestiones relacionadas con la implementación de estas eh, coetiquetas eh, en las empresas. Bien, eh, una de las preguntas que se hizo en la encuesta fue las razones por las cuales la empresa o el productor había implementado este tipo de certificaciones en su negocio. Vemos ahí una serie de, de respuestas que se, opciones que se le dio a, a, a la persona que se encuestó. 
y podemos ver pues, que el mayor porcentaje de respuesta eh, a la hora de implementar un, una certificación de este tipo pues estaba relacionado con el, la mejora de la reputación de, de la compañía o del negocio eh, sobre todo podemos ver ahí pues el, el, sobre todo en lo que eran productores a nivel de, de pesca y acuicultura eh, eh, y eh, otra de las razones eh, podemos ver es la presión del cliente ¿Eh? Las empresas pues, sienten que hay una presión por parte de sus clientes eh, a la hora de, de comprar estos productos. ¿Eh? Ahí podemos ver, sobre todo, que se centra en lo que son las empresas de procesado y, com y comercio. ¿Eh? Eh, se ve una mayor presión de los clientes para que estas empresas implementen estas ecoetiquetas. Y otra de las razones donde más peso se dio es a la entrada de nuevos mercados. ¿no? ¿Eh? Entre las diferentes razones que se expusieron, pues fueron las que mayor peso relativo tuvieron. Bien, entre los problemas que dieron estas empresas para, digamos, eh, eh, implementar estas, eh, estas certificaciones, pues las que mayor peso tuvieron fueron, pues como ya, hemos, ya he comentado, pues las, los costes de la certificación y sobre todo todo el trabajo administrativo que conlleva ¿no? el... el implementar un, una certificación de este tipo. Luego sí que eh, encontramos que entre eh, las grandes empresas eh, se encontraba un problema que era eh, qué etiqueta o qué certificación escoger, pues ante las diferentes certificaciones que puede encontrarse en el mercado de diferentes tipos, pues eh, cuál de ellas pues, le podría venir mejor a la empresa y bueno, se pues, encontraban que que había una cierta dificultad a la hora de elegir entre, entre esas certificaciones. Bien, el, lo siguiente eh, que preguntamos fue en aquellas empresas que, que no, se ha, no habían implementado este tipo de certificaciones, pues fue preguntarles por qué no lo habían hecho, ¿eh? cuáles eran las razones. Y como podemos ver, pues eh, tanto el... el peso de lo que era el inconveniente administrativo, ¿no? el trabajo administrativo que supone la certificación más los costes, pues eh, fueron las respuestas que mayor porcentaje tuvieron. Y también eh, encontramos que en el caso de, eh, de que no tenían suficiente información para hacerlo, para implementar este tipo de certificaciones, pues sobre todo aquellas empresas o negocios más pequeños ¿Eh? pequeñas empresas o microempresas, pues encontraron que realmente eh, no tenían suficiente información pues, para eh, llevar a cabo adelante esa implementación de la certificación. Bien, en cuanto a la pregunta que se les hizo sobre si la certificación les había supuesto una mejora de ingresos y de beneficios en las empresas, Bien, podemos ver que, que sí que en algunas empresas, eh, sobre todo de productores de acuicultura y, y, y de pesca, pues sí que dieron una respuesta por encima de la media en cuanto a, a rendimiento y aumento de los, de los ingresos. Y sobre todo vemos que en las, pequeñas, las más pequeñas empresas, las microempresas, pues que realmente es donde digamos menos veían ese beneficio o ese aumento de ventas en la certificación. O sea, que realmente veían que la certificación no, no, no les había supuesto un aumento de beneficio o de, o de ventas frente a las, a las grandes empresas. Bien, eso en cuanto al primer ejemplo de estudio empírico que, que hemos realizado de, de, del mercado. El segundo estudio que realizamos tiene que ver con el efecto que conlleva la implementación de una una ecoetiqueta en la empresa y su efecto en los eh, rendimientos, en la rentabilidad o en la cuota de mercado de la empresa. ¿eh? Entonces, si pasáis a la siguiente diapositiva, ¿eh? como ya hemos visto, eh, el ecocertificado pues, conlleva una serie de, in, de, de beneficios para las empresas, pero también una serie de costes y lo que tratamos de ver es de si a la hora de implementar esa certificación pues eh, conllevó un aumento en la rentabilidad o en la cuota de mercado de, de, la, de la empresa. Bien, esto fue un estudio que hicimos hace ya unos años 
pues, eh, fue un estudio que se publicó por Glossfries eh, en el año 2012, es un, un estudio que se hizo sobre el ecoetiquetado de productos pesqueros en España. Y bueno, aquí se cogió una muestra de empresas eh, del sector de la cadena de valor de productos pesqueros y acuícolas en España y empresas pues, que a lo largo del tiempo se habían ecocertificado por MSF. ¿eh? Podemos ver ahí eh, la evolución en el tiempo, del 2005 hasta 2010. Vemos cómo las empresas, fue una muestra de 25 empresas, cómo esas empresas pues, eh, empezaron, ninguna tenía la ecocertificación y a lo largo del tiempo pues, se fueron eh, certificando en diferentes momentos de tiempo, eh, eh, hasta el 2010, bueno, donde eh, dentro de la muestra pues, ah, hubo empresas que estaban ya certificadas y otras que no. Bien, hicimos un análisis eh, econométrico eh, con los datos de, de, en este caso fue de, de ROA, de rentabilidad sobre activos, de estas empresas, eh, controlando el, el efecto tamaño que pudiese tener sobre las empresas y se comprobó pues, que sí, eh, utilizando diferentes métodos estadísticos, se comprobó pues, que el, el momento en que la empresa se certificaba con MSC, pues la empresa veía un incremento ¿eh? en su ROA de dos puntos porcentuales, más o menos, ¿eh? y vemos un efecto positivo ¿eh? Eh, en esas empresas en su ROA. Lo mismo ocurría con la rentabilidad sobre ventas. ¿eh? La rentabilidad sobre ventas en la siguiente diapositiva podemos ver que el efecto también fue positivo, que en, un en el momento en que la empresa se implementaba su certificación MSC, pues vemos que hay un efecto también positivo en la rentabilidad sobre ventas, alrededor también de dos puntos porcentuales más de estas empresas sobre las que no se certificaron. Bien, en la siguiente diapositiva se puede ver el efecto sobre el, la cuota de mercado. Ahí sí que podemos ver que hay un efecto positivo, pero que no es significativo, o al menos estadísticamente no salió positivo. ¿eh? Y entonces, bueno, pues la conclusión fue que sí que estas empresas vieron mejorados sus eh, rendimientos financieros en cuanto a rentabilidad sobre activos y sobre ventas, pero no tanto, o no se vio tanto reflejado en lo que es la cuota de mercado de las empresas. Bien, y el tercer estudio que, que traigo aquí a presentar es el último, uno de los últimos que hemos hecho, que va a ser publicado en breve en la revista Marine Policy. Y es un estudio sobre la certificación MSC en el pulpo asturiano. Entonces, eh, el, es, un, es un estudio relacionado con la existencia de Price Premium. ¿Eh? del premio sobre precio, de realmente comprobar si los productos certificados por MSC pues eh, tienen un, un mayor, obtienen un mayor precio en el mercado que el resto de productos sin certificar. Bien, eh, sí que existe una amplia eh, evidencia empírica de diferentes estudios, trabajos hechos en los últimos años sobre que eh, sí existe un price premium eh, a la hora eh, de que el consumidor compra productos ecocertificados, paga más por ellos que eh, cuando compra otros productos sin certificar. ¿eh? Pero ese price premium se ha detectado a nivel de consumidor. ¿eh? Consumidor que paga un producto al distribuidor, ¿no? al retailer que le vende el producto. Pero la cuestión que estaba todavía sin estudiar o analizar suficientemente es eh, si ese premio lo recibe también el productor, porque aquí lo que se trata es de que si queremos que el productor, el, el pescador eh, o productor eh, de productos acuícolas eh, quiera conservar el medio ambiente, eh, realmente necesita un premio eh, para, para justificar ¿no? eh, el, el certificarse ¿no? o el ecocertificarse. Bien, eh, y sobre todo... El que no fuesen grandes productores, porque sí ya hay algún estudio realizado en, en, en otras publicaciones, pues ya en estos últimos años ha sido publicado algún trabajo sobre 
eh, sobre productores, pero a nivel grandes productores, pero faltaba un poco el estudio de pequeños productores, que suelen ser los más reacios al, al obtener la ecocertificación, ¿eh? Eh, principalmente por el motivo económico, ¿no? eh, que realmente eh, no encuentra la justificación económica para ecocertificarse. Bueno, pues nosotros hicimos un trabajo, cogiendo el, el caso del pulpo asturiano, eh, ha sido la, la, primera, la primera pesquería de pulpo certificada en el mundo por MSC. Entonces, esta, esta pesquería se certificó entre los años 2014 y 2015. ¿eh? La certificación les llevó dos años y a partir ya del año 2016 todos los productos eh, eh, certificados con MSC pues, se, se, ponía, se pudieron vender en cuatro puertos de Asturias eh, eh, con ese certificado eh, a partir del año 2016. Bueno, podemos ver ahí eh, dónde está la pesquería. Eh, es una zona norte de, de España. Es una pesquería de pequeña escala. Eh, representa eh, más o menos el 10% de buques del total de, de los buques de la región de, de Asturias. Y podemos ver ahí, como podéis ver, eh, tenemos ahí la evolución de precios de, de, de este producto, del, del pulpo común, ¿eh? en los puertos de Asturias, separando aquellos puertos que sí pueden vender con, o tienen acreditado la certificación MSC con aquellos puertos que realmente no la tienen. ¿no? Y lo que sí podemos ver es que a partir del año 2016 pues, eh, hay una diferencia significativa, relevante estadísticamente, ¿eh? una diferencia de precio que a nivel medio en esos cuatro años viene a ser de un, un euro, un euro cinco céntimos, eh, un euro once céntimos más de sobreprecio eh, eh, sobre el, el precio del, del pulpo eh, sin certificar. Viene a ser un, entre un 15 y un 25% eh, de, de sobreprecio ¿no? o, de, o, o, de, o premio eh, que obtiene el, el pescador certificado. ¿no? Bien, eh, uno puede preguntarse, bueno, ¿y esos, ese beneficio, ese premio, compensa los costes que llevó la ecocertificación? Bueno, pues tenemos ahí eh, en la transparencia, en la diapositiva, podemos ver los costes que conllevó el implementar esta ecocertificación. Hay que, eh, tengo que contar que este es, eh, es un, un proyecto que se lleva de manera conjunta, viene a ser un partneriado, eh, viene a ser una asociación eh, entre lo que son los diferentes pescadores de esos cuatro puertos eh, que se certificaron. Eh, también interviene el grupo de acción local pesquera de esa zona y eh, también colaboran a nivel de costes, pues eh, colabora el gobierno regional de Asturias con 9.000 euros y también eh, la Unión Europea con los fondos de, europeos de la pesca con 27.000 euros. ¿Eh? Lo que es, eh, digamos, la, el, el grupo de acción local pesquera de, de, de esa zona, pues colaboró con 7.600 euros. ¿eh? Como podemos ver, si hacemos un cálculo rápido, eh, este, eh, este producto eh, tiene limitado la venta al año unas 100 toneladas. Más o menos se venden 100 toneladas al año de este producto. Con un euro de media, más o menos, de premio, en cuatro años eh, son unos beneficios de eh, unos ingresos adicionales de 400.000 euros, más o menos, de media. ¿eh? Vemos que el coste que supuso eh, de implementación de, esta, de este eh, ecoetiquetado, eh, ecoetiquetado fueron de alrededor de unos 40.000 euros. Entonces podemos ver que sí, este, este proyecto para estos pequeños pescadores artesanales, pues les supuso o les ha supuesto un beneficio, una mejora económica. ¿Eh? Bien, aquí tenemos un poco los análisis, ¿eh? las diferencias de precio a nivel estadístico, tanto a diferencia de medias como a nivel, ¿eh? el estudio se ha hecho también a nivel econométrico, ¿eh? y ahí podemos ver un poco la, las diferencias de precio, de dónde vienen, ¿eh? Eh, algo más de un, de un euro. ¿eh? Y bueno, esto es todo. ¿eh? Eh, muchas gracias por su atención y bueno, pues estoy aquí disponible para todas aquellas preguntas que, que quieran hacerme. Muchas gracias.
Thank you very much. Um, just Pedro, uh, we don't have the French translation uh, since the, the half of the, the presentation. Uh, I don't know if it can be fixed for the question. Um, so yes, uh, we have uh, one question for, for you, Jose. Um, hi, Jose, thank you very, mm -hmm. uh, thank you for your presentation. I'm delighted to hear a panelist expand our understanding of our concept of sustainability to include all stakeholders. My question is, should eco-labeling include the monitoring of the return uh, the industry requires so to implement all the other criteria that are required to meet? Mm, no he entendido bien la pregunta. No sé si me lo... Me lo podéis aclarar un poco más. So, uh, maybe we will wait for Patrick Murphy to rewrite the question. Um, so, we had another question for Eva, I think, from the last presentation. Uh, Hans did not fully get the answer as a dynamic analysis That's available, right. can be answered later, perhaps. Uh... Can I answer? Sorry. Yep. Uh, uh, the, it, is, uh, it is not so much a dynamic analysis. I think this information does exist in my institution. I am happy to, to retrieve it for you, but uh, this and this information that I presented is more a snapshot. So what is the situation in the end of 2019 for the certified fisheries with reference to the uh, targets and objectives of uh, fishing mortality and uh, biomass levels at the levels of MSY? Thank you. Uh... So, uh, in the meantime, we have another question for Jose. Uh, thank you for a very interesting presentation and especially your very thorough empiric empirical case study, which illustrating well the MSC certification clearly led to better economic performance of the businesses that got engage without necessarily uh, affecting market share. I'm happy to see that you did take a look at changes of performance over time. This is critical to assess impact and exactly this was lacking in the previous presentation by Germain, which therefore presented a distorted biased uh, picture. Would you say the last case illustrates that small scale fisheries also can effectively access a certification program and benefit from it? Sí, eh, vamos, por lo, los resultados de este estudio y por otros anteriores, pues eh, sí que se ve que hay un, eh, que los productores pueden obtener un premio eh, de Peque de pequeña escala, realmente este es el único trabajo que, que hay, eh, que se va a publicar en estos momentos sobre, sobre pesquerías eh, certificadas por MSC. Entonces, no puedo generalizar porque realmente, salvo este estudio que hemos hecho, eh, no puedo hablar a un nivel general. Sí que, por ejemplo, eh, hay que tener en cuenta que... Eh, esto, esto era una pesquería, es una pesquería pequeña, artesanal, que se produce al año 100 toneladas. Ha sido la primera pesquería certificada por MSC. No es la única porque ya en este año, en 2020, ya hay otra en el mundo, que es una, una australiana, también de, 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 de pulpo, que produce algo más, son unos 300, unas 300 toneladas, con lo cual... Sí que eh, poco a poco se va viendo que las pequeñas pesquerías, eh, pesquerías de pequeña escala, peque pesquerías más artesanales, poco a poco están entrando en la ecocertificación, eh, concretamente eh, no solo en MSC, hay, hay otras ecocertificaciones eh, que también eh, están llevando a cabo esta labor, pero eh, principalmente es MSC. Y eh, sí que se va viendo pues, que estas pequeñas pesquerías poco a poco van viendo 
de que con colaboración, ¿eh? porque aquí es muy importante eh, que no es un trabajo hecho, un esfuerzo hecho solo por los pescadores, que eso, pues, eh, como he dicho antes, pueden ser muy reacios a, a, a ellos solos implementar una, una ecoetiqueta por, por el coste o el alto coste o esfuerzo que tienen que realizar, pero que con la colaboración, como en este caso, que es no solo de los pescadores, sino de las cofradías de pescadores, la, la, el grupo de acción local pesquera, estos grupos que en Europa son muy importantes, que tienen, eh, pueden desarrollar una labor muy importante en este, de este tipo, junto con la ayuda económica de la Unión Europea y de los gobiernos nacionales o regionales, eh, que apoyan eh, 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 con el coste, eh, con gran parte del coste que conlleva esta ecocertificación, pues podemos ver que, que es algo que trae beneficios a la, a la comunidad, a comunidades locales, en este caso, no solo beneficio a nivel de medioambiental, pero también económico-social, ¿no? ¿Eh? Porque consiguen mantener a un grupo de actividad muy importante en grupos eh, pequeños, grupos, eh, pequeñas poblaciones, costeras, ¿eh? y estos esfuerzos yo creo que son importantes. Thank you very much. Uh, so, in the meantime, we had the uh, rephrasing of the question of Patrick Murphy. So, to implement an eco label, it needs to be paid for. So, with regard to the monetary return to the producer, do you believe it should be included in the eco label process? When uh, no, no sigo sin entender muy bien a lo que se refiere, es decir, eh, cuando se refiere a integrar dentro del proceso de etiquetado ecológico, ¿a, a qué se refiere? O sea, hacer una evaluación económica antes de llevar a cabo la, la ecocertificación. All right, uh, we will wait for Patrick Murphy to rephrase it again. Um, mm, 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 mm. So the next one, uh, from, uh, again from Hans. Uh, would you say that the cooperation between the different ports around Navia, uh, in fact, was also an impact or was the pre-existent? Was that pre-existent? Bueno, realmente antes de, de 2014, el producto, el pulpo que se pescaba en Asturias ya se hacía de una manera sostenible porque estaba regulado localmente el gobierno, el gobierno regional de Asturias, tenía un plan ya de, de sostenibilidad del producto. Es un producto eh, que se produce de una manera sostenible, con unas cualidades eh, eh, muy, eh, de calidad muy importantes. Pero, ¿cuál era el problema de este producto? Pues que le faltaba la visibilidad a la hora de, de venderse, ¿eh? pues realmente eh, no lograba diferenciarse del resto de pulpo que se vendía pues, en el resto de, de puertos eh, de la zona costera, ¿no? o al, de alrededor de, de, de esa zona. Eh, la razón de la ecocertificación fue más el, el, el plus que aportaba el tener la ecoetiqueta MSC. Sobre todo, eh, este producto es un producto que se exporta, se vende a, a, a empresas que procesan y venden el producto luego en, en mercados eh, con un alto nivel de renta, como Estados Unidos, Japón. ¿Eh? es donde se, se vende este producto y ahí es donde la etiqueta MSC pues, juega un papel muy importante y da una visibilidad muy importante a este producto. ¿eh? Entonces, los eh, productores de esa zona lo que buscaron eh, en el año 2014 fue eh, buscar esa etiqueta que les iba a suponer visibilizar y diferenciar mejor su producto frente al resto de productos eh, o al resto de, de, de pulpo que se pescaba en la misma zona, pero que en el mercado pues, no tiene una visibilidad o no se le pone en valor. 
¿eh? Entonces, la etiqueta no solo cumple un fin que es el medioambiental, ¿eh? preocuparse por la sostenibilidad de los recursos marinos, sino también tiene otros beneficios, como ya he comentado, ¿eh? a nivel económico para las empresas o productores. ¿no? Y el tema de la visibilidad aquí ha sido muy importante ¿eh? para obtener ese premio o ese, o ese sobreprecio sobre el producto. Sorry. Uh, thank you very much. Um, so last question. Uh, uh, thank you for, for the presentation. In comparison with Nordic markets like Germany or the Netherlands, third party certification in Spain is still relatively underdeveloped in favor of self certification by retail and industry. Do you have an idea why is this and is the situation changing uh, if you know? Bueno, en España cada vez más eh, los productores eh, están yendo a la ecocertificación. Eh, por ejemplo, en el caso de MSC, que es el, eh, el, el caso igual pues, que más implementado está, eh, no solo eh, tenemos aquí el caso de, del pulpo gallego, pero hay otros casos como puede ser el, eh, la anchoa, por ejemplo, que es un producto también muy importante en la zona norte, eh, la costa cantábrica de España. Eh, la anchoa, eh, el, el bonito o atún eh, el, del, de la zona del Cantábrico, también la sardina. Eh, ahí está MSC colaborando con, con los pescadores, productores y, tanto, y, tan, y también con las cofradías de pescadores para que cada vez más haya una mayor implementación de esta ecocertificación en, en diferentes productos pesqueros. O sea, que, que, que veo que es una tendencia creciente, ¿no? O de futuro. All right, thank you very much. Uh, so, it seems we, uh, we not have any question. So, <coughs> if there is no more question, uh yeah all right uh so if we we don't have any question uh, i will conclude this session uh at time actually uh so thank you very much to all the participants and all the the panelists uh it was uh they were really interesting uh presentation and analysis uh so Uh, tomorrow uh, we will have the last session. Uh, we will talk about uh, the consumer's attitude, the environmental footprint, and then we will move to uh, the presentation of some um, uh, sustainability schemes like uh, Pêche Durable, uh, Responsible Fishing, <coughs> Uh, best aquaculture practices, uh, responsible tuna fishery standards, and the uh, MSC uh, schemes that we have uh, talked about a lot uh, yesterday and today. And then we will focus a little bit uh, on the last point, which is animal welfare. So thank you very much. Thank you for the translators. Uh, thank you for Pedro. And uh, I hope I don't uh, miss anybody. So uh, thank you very much and uh, see you tomorrow.